morning, Facebook. Good morning, New Horizons Fellowship. Uh, it is Monday, April 6th, day after Palm Sunday, which is going to be relevant for what we're talking about later today. As you can see, I've moved to a different location. Um, and that's also relevant for what we're talking about today. I've invited you to join me on this uh, Holy Week, retracing the steps of Jesus. Uh, so we've moved to a sanctuary. Hopefully the audio will be good enough for you. If not, I'll fix it by tomorrow. Um, but And also as we go through, we're going to be here every day this week. Uh, my name is Pastor Jeff Elliott of New Horizons Fellowship in New Haven, Indiana. Thanks for uh, tuning in. If you're here, you can go ahead and comment and let me know that you're watching. Otherwise, I'll just assume that everybody's watching it later. Uh, but we might be a little bit shorter uh, this week. I'd like to keep it closer to 10 minutes uh, than to 15, but you know how us preachers are. Sometimes things just keep going and um, we can't get ourselves stopped. But anyway, I'm glad you're here today. I want to, if you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 11. Uh, yesterday on Palm Sunday, we read the first uh, 11 verses of that book, and we're going to pick up verse 12 today. Uh, yesterday, we, we I called it kind of the coronation of, of Christ on Palm Sunday. They wanted him to be a Messiah, uh, anoint him as king, and so forth. Um, but today, we're going to look at the cleansing. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 11 uh, and look at the first uh, verse 12 to 19. Uh, so as I began to think about this week and how we would retrace the life of Christ, um, yesterday, I asked us to think about what was Christ's prayer like, uh, knowing that he had about one week before he would be crucified. And then I thought about myself, and you could ask yourself as well, if you knew you had a week to live, what would you do in that week? Uh, and that's what we're going to see in the life of in, in what Jesus did in his last week. And I think they're all very important things. We've probably all considered that at some point. Uh, so we want to find out what Jesus did in his last week. Uh, we know that he is sent on this mission from God, and ultimately he's going to die for the sins of all men. Um, but how does he spend that last week? So if you have a Bible, I want to read Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 12 to 19. It says, The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. And I read that to you today, because we're going to come back to that tomorrow, because the fig tree figures back in the story tomorrow. Uh, but just a quick note, Jesus is leaving Bethany, where we noticed that he left the temple last night after it says he looked all around and looked at everything. Uh, and then he, he went to Bethany. We're assuming the home of, of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Um, so now he's on his way back from Bethany, back into the temple on that holy week. And then verse 15 it says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And then verse 19 says, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. So we can assume that there's one day going on here, which is the day that we're going to talk about uh, uh, right now. When Jesus goes into the temple, you're probably familiar with the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. And there's just a couple things that I wanted to point out to us, a couple quotes that I wanted to share with us. Um, and as I talked, about, I just told you we're going to share more about the fig tree. And the cursing of that tomorrow, and it's about two miles from Bethany back to the temple as Jesus is on his way. Uh, we noted there in verse 18 that now the, the, the Pharisees are looking for a way to kill him. It's not the first time that has happened, uh, and the, but then we know that this time ultimately they'll be successful. There was a prophecy in Malachi chapter 3 of, uh, that the Messiah, uh, the prophet said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So Jesus is fulfilling a messianic prophecy by doing this. As he gets to the temple, he sees money changing going on, and this is a, a fairly uh, normal thing. It's not that Jesus was upset that it was going on, because what they would do is they would have to offer coins, in, in like an offering like we do here at the church. But the Roman coins and the currency that they used had an image on it. And for the Jewish mindset, that was idolatry. So they would have to exchange their Roman or whatever Greek coins they had for, uh, I forget what the name was called, a Tyrian coin, I think it was. 
um, it, it, which also had an image, which was good, but it's, you know, splitting hairs on that for them. Um, so that's what they were doing. And it wasn't necessarily uh, something that we wouldn't expect to see in the temple. Um, but I've got an interesting slant on it that I just learned actually just this morning as I was studying this passage. Uh, but the first thing we're usually familiar with is that as Jesus, we talked about Jesus cursing the fig tree, and then he goes into the temple. And there's and Mark tells it in an interesting way. He tells part of the story of the fig tree, then he tells about the temple, and then he tells about the rest of the fig tree, which we'll, we'll combine both of the fig trees tomorrow, which is it's unique in Mark because Matthew tells the whole story of the fig tree and then the temple. So Mark wants us to see this as an, uh, one continuous event, fig tree, temple, fig tree again. And we're going to, uh, we'll come back to that tomorrow. But someone has, has come, has made a commentary about that this way, about the combining of the fig tree and the temple. It says, our Lord's condemning of the tree and cleansing of the temple were both symbolic acts that illustrated the sad spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. In spite of its many privileges and opportunities, Israel was outwardly fruitless because of the tree and inwardly corrupt because of the temple. We see that Jesus is dealing with both of those things, the, the lack of an outward fruit and, and the, the necessity of cleansing an inward uh, and, and disease or whatever we might say it was, a, a corruptness. Um, so that was the first quote I wanted to share. And that's traditionally how we think about the temple, but we didn't combine it with the fig tree. But there was another quote that I read this morning because uh, I often have this image in my mind, you probably do as well, of Jesus going into the temple, and uh, sometimes we picture it with a whip. I think uh, one of the Gospels says Jesus had a whip. Maybe that was a different occasion that John's talking about. Um, but we all often think about why was um, Jesus angry about this? What was going on? And in your own mind, you begin to wonder about all the things that we know about Jesus. This seems so inconsistent with what we've been taught and what we think about him. Well, there's an interesting slant that I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, a couple things. First off, if Jesus had gone into the temple and this had been a big, big scene, uh, the Romans would have been able to uh, come in. Uh, would have, they, had, they could actually see what was going on from Herod's temple, which Herod's palace, which overlooked the temple, and they would have come down and tried to uh, and tried to um, to stop this big riot that was going on. It's Passover week. There's extra extra guards there and extra Roman guards. Um, so it wasn't a like. This is a massive undertaking. Jesus doing more of a symbolic act than a violent revolution. Uh, and I see that some of you are saying we have a, a frozen video. I'm in a new location today. Maybe we'll have to switch that out for tomorrow. Uh, but I wanted that to lead into the second quote that I found. Hopefully you can just reload the page. Uh, but you're not hearing me say that if I'm frozen. So back to the idea of Jesus doing a symbolic act of overthrowing the temple. It says he assaults the foundation of the temple's operation the contributions and sacrifices. If money cannot be exchanged into the holy currency, then monetary support for the temple sacrifices in the priesthood must end. If sacrificial animals cannot be purchased, then sacrifice must end. And as I read that phrase this morning, I thought, well, I never considered scripture that way. That what Jesus is doing is he's not necessarily angry about this this exchanging of money and buying of animals that's going on in the temple because that was a normal thing. What he's doing is he's doing a symbolic thing that there's no longer going to be a need for a priest or for animal sacrifice because he is that sacrifice. And I want you to begin to think about that way because uh, I want to read another passage from Hebrews chapter 9 um, because as I read that, that passage from that book, it reminded me of Hebrews chapter 9 verses 24 through 26 and it says this, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But here's the part I want you to see. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the first symbolic act of Jesus' last holy week on earth is to go into the temple and overthrow the need for sacrifices and, of, and for priesthood. And Hebrews talks a lot about uh, Jesus as the great high priest as well. So maybe you need to rethink this idea about, oh, Jesus was up ang angry about what was going on. And there's a possibility there was um, uh, money going on. But what Jesus said was, you've made this a place of business instead of a house of prayer. So then when Jesus comes and overthrows the sacrificial system, 
it's completely it can completely dedicate itself to prayer. And interestingly enough, Mark adds the phrase for all nations. We don't see that in the other gospels. So Mark's making this emphasis as well. So I wanted to share that with you this morning. And the reason I'm sitting here in our sanctuary is behind me, you can see right here, uh, I've brought one of our kneelers that we have in our church. When we're talking about Jesus cleansing the temple, we should also think about ourselves as his temple. That's what it says in uh, 2 Timothy, I believe, um, that we are, his, we are his temple. It's a place for confession, a place for repentance, uh, a place for cleansing. Uh, and as you enter this Holy Week, um, you may have a, uh, a prayer closet, a prayer chair. Uh, maybe you have a kneeler in your house. Maybe you just kneel beside your bed. Maybe you have an office or a, a den. Uh, let me encourage you to, to take today, as Jesus went in to, to overthrow the sacrificial system, to cleanse the temple, to set it up for what he had intended to become. Ask God to prepare you for this week for what he wants to do in you. Also take the time to cleanse your temple. Ask God to forgive any sins that you can think of. And then ask him to restore you as a house of prayer. Um, and I pray that will be a, a challenge to you today. Um, and I wanted us to pray again. We've been, uh, one thing I do want to continue from previous weeks is our prayer focus as we move forward. Uh, and I had a thought, uh, I was thinking the other day, that a lot of us are uh, at home a lot more. And that means many families are spending time together. And I thought that may not in every situation, that may not be the best idea. I thought of some foster kids or, you know, just uh, somebody's own kids who are subject to abuse and neglect and those sorts of things. And I wanted to uh, just kind of remember them today, uh, pray that the Lord would protect them, that maybe someone's heart would shift, that they would be drawn more towards someone in their family. Um, that God would be able to restore and renew relationships as we know he intends to do. Uh, so maybe you're thinking of a specific situation that it's not uh, it's not an ideal situation for a family to spend a lot of time together or for someone who's is watching someone else's kids. Uh, well, let's let's remember that those situations in prayer this morning and make that your focus. Heavenly Father, I uh, come to you this morning. Thank you for a little bit of insight into your word. Uh, for again, giving us a symbolism of um, seeing Jesus as the once and for all sacrifice. Um, Lord, we are reminded again today of our hope of salvation is you. Uh, by your shed blood on the cross, we claim it today as payment for our sins. We come to you today, we confess those. Uh, we repent of them, Lord. We ask you to cleanse our hearts. Help us to turn away from those sins uh, that constantly come back to us. Help us to be restored in relationships to those around us. Lord, we pray that in, in situations that are not ideal, when families are dysfunctional and not healthy, we pray that your spirit would intervene in those situations and strengthen the relationships. Um, may they uh, fall, husbands and wives, fall in love with each other again, uh, and with their and and with their children as well. Pray that as we extend patience and grace to each other at this time, uh, we can see it as an honor, as a as a gift to you that brings honor to your name. Um, we pray again for uh, against this illness that is coming across our land and around the world. Lord, we pray that you would heal those who have been afflicted, and that you would prevent it from going any farther. And we trust you in all things. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you. God bless you. Hope to see you back here every day this week uh, at 10 o'clock. God bless, and I'll see you tomorrow.